This week on the Catholic Vote Radio Hour... You have the initial persecution of the man who walked in and shot up a room full of Christians, and on the back end you have the cultural persecution of anyone that dare say we should pray for. After a militant atheist slaughters Christians at prayer, the left responds by prayer-shaming Christians. Nate Madden of CRTV explains. My morning routine does start off the same way every day, and I think it's critically important to start off with prayer. Matt Rosendale, Montana candidate for U.S. Senate, explains his Catholic faith and his politics. I just see life, hope, and power and sense of purpose in the pro-life view, and that is attractive. Susan B. Anthony List President Marjorie Dannenfelser explains why the new civil rights movement is winning. In the early days of broadcasting, few people realized what a fine art radio was to become. Hello, you're listening to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour. Surgeon General's warning, extremely addictive, but no negative side effects. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. There's an old saying that we get the kind of government we deserve. Study the issues, study the candidates, and then work to elect the right officials. Thank you, Nate Madden of CRTV, for joining us again to discuss, of course, the horrific shooting in Texas. There's a lot of commentary flurrying around, much of it centering around gun control, pro or against. And I think a lot of it misses a point that you've zeroed in on, Nate. 27 Christians were just slaughtered, as it happens, by a militant atheist while at prayer. And the response of many mainstream commentators was to dis prayer. Well, yes, and this is what we saw immediately afterwards, the response all over social media. We've got a couple of videos out this week on CRTV on the Capitol Hill brief talking about this. But the first of those was just look at the grotesque and vile things that a lot of these pro-gun control folks started pushing the minute someone dared say we should send our thoughts and prayers to victims, that we should pray for these victims. Because this happened in a church, so many of them said, and we outlined these on the segment, it's their proof that prayer didn't matter. Prayer is not going to do anything. That right. It's all a wash. It's all a waste. What we really need is we need government. Right. We need to turn away from any and all theistic answers to this and bow down at the altar of government and get something out of that because that's the only thing that is going to prevent things like this, supposedly. Yeah. It reminds me, you know, the founders, what they had in mind with the Second Amendment, I think it worked in tandem with their attitude about culture and spirituality and morality. Religiosity and virtue have to be a big part of our culture. And if we ever lose that, we're in big trouble trouble. Well, exactly. Because here's the problem. When you don't have anything greater than government to look to, anything more solid than an abstract federal state somewhere off in a swamp in Washington, D.C., what you end up arguing over, it's different factions just fighting for the big brass ring of who controls what government. We need those mediating institutions. We need a moral people. We need churches. We need families. We need the higher things that create the kinds of citizens that are necessary to sustain a free and a stable republic. And people are turning on that. I mean, they've been turning on it for a while, but we just saw that out in the open on Sunday this week right? and afterwards. Yeah. Well, and it doesn't help. The uh, crime took place in a church. He's an outspoken atheist who chose to shoot up a church, not a post office, not a mall. He shot up a church and 27 people, including children, not just his mother-in-law with whom apparently he had some sort of domestic disagreement. It's really hard to buy the idea that it had nothing to do with with his militant atheism or the Christianity of his victims. Oh, yeah, it's, it's hard to buy that, that it's completely sterilized of that factor. And from what we're seeing in the reports and what we're hearing from officials, there appear to be some contributing factors about why he chose this one and some beefs that he had with the pastor and beefs that he had with his mother-in-law, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact remains that at the end of the day, somebody walked into and shot up a church full of Christians at prayer. Right. Like you said, it's not a post office. There is a reason this was right. chosen. Right. And then afterwards, I love the phrase prayer shaming because there was a lot of it. Shut up with your prayers. We hate your stupid prayers. And they even went so far as to say the stupid victims were in a house of prayer doing prayers and that didn't help them because God doesn't answer. Pr-. It's the most sneering, snarling mockery of the Christianity of the victims who just died. Can you imagine if a mosque was shot up and afterwards we were saying, well, let's mock their faith right after 27 of them have been killed by an outspoken opponent of Islam. That would never happen. Oh, no. You'd see a lavish outpouring of solidarity and support and interfaith prayer and all this stuff. And No. But this is what we were promised. Mm -hmm. We were promised persecution. You have the one end of the initial persecution of the man who walked in and shot up a room full of Christians. And on the back end, you have the cultural persecution of anyone that dare say we should pray for it. Wow. That's really dark. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we, we, this is part of the deal, bro. Yeah. I mean, this is in the Beatitudes. Right. This was what we were promised from the outset. God incarnate came to earth 
as a man and he didn't promise us a bed of roses. Right. He promised us a lot of persecution in his name. We knew that we'd be targeted. Right. But also, not only was there prayer shaming, but afterwards, you remember when there was a moment of silence at the Capitol, a Democrat senator, I think this was very symbolic. Ted Lieu. Right, right. Walked out of the moment of silence. The left has no culture. All they have is state power and politics. It's all about control. The ordinary decencies of life from prayer for victims to a simple moment of silence, they don't mean anything to these people. They have completely dispensed with the culture and every aspect of it that keeps our nation sustainable in the opinion of the founders. If we lose that culture, that religiosity, do we even deserve to be free anymore? First, no, we don't. That's not a properly ordered freedom. But we just simply won't. Mm -hmm. We won't be free. These are the things when we lose our sight, when we lose the thing that orders liberty, we will eventually lose liberty. And that's, that's what we're seeing play out on several different stages across our culture right now. Mm -hmm. But the point that I got to in the video at CRTV, you can watch it on the website, is that you have two fundamentally different theologies, two different worldviews going on here, even if one side doesn't realize that it has its own theology, right? So let's look at what we've got here. We've got a situation where all the statistics bear out, all the reason bears out that all these broad, sweeping gun control measures that get talked about every single time there is a tragedy wouldn't effectively stop these tragedies from happening. That's not in the cards. It's not realistic. What we can do is pray. Those of us who pray, we acknowledge that there is a God sovereign at the center of the universe who can change men's souls, who can put good guys with guns opposite bad guys with guns, which is at the end of the day what stopped this incident. We know that God can put people in the way of, of bad things, that ultimately at the end of the day, this is the most appropriate way to respond to being faced with a world where evil has such capabilities. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have those who see government filling that role. Somehow, despite all the numbers, despite all the statistics, right. despite all the evidence that their prescriptions would not stop these tragedies from happening, mm -hmm. you still see the acolytes of the almighty government right. pushing their worldview into the situation. They don't respond with thoughts and prayers because the liturgy here, the thoughts, the prayers, it's all regulation. Regulation policy. Right? What, exactly. a, what a cold, dark exactly. world to live in where there is no God, there is no character. You know, a huge factor here is one pattern that is unbelievably predictable. The men who do these shootings are often fatherless and are obviously people of low character, often from irreligious backgrounds or people who have even been outspoken against religion and morality. The person who was not raised, say, in a two-parent household where they went to church every Sunday, or even if they did, they've since rejected that violently. And the left responds to this by saying, let's continue to reject that violently and ignore the fact that we have a pandemic problem of people of little character. These people who go on rampages are people who are morally malformed. And Christian preachers who talk about, well, we need to have good people, virtue matters, they're jeered at even in the wake of tragedies like this shooting, which in themselves prove that virtue is important. That's exactly it. Look at how much access we had to firearms throughout the entire history of this country. And we actually had a solidly formed culture and we had when we had a civil, moral, and religious people more so than we did today. Right. You know, it was unimaginable in previous generations, right? I mean, yes, you had like all the rampant, awful stuff that goes on with organized crime during prohibition, but who in the world was walking into churches and schools and doing these things? Right. But this gets to the heart of the matter, and the heart of the matter is the heart of the perpetrator, right? Right. This is the issue. We have a malformed culture. We have a malformed culture. We're losing our civil institutions. The family is falling apart. Of course, a lot of people are waking up. As much as we talk about liberty, we're starting to realize that we just don't have the civil safety net, the kind of cultural capital that we need for a free society. If we do get rid of all these government superstructures, if we do give people the kind of liberty they're asking for, what in the world do they fall back on? Those mediating institutions that are supposed to be buffers between individuals and states, families, communities, and everything else, they are so atrophied. And they are so decrepit right now. Yeah. Well, just take two different people. A person who was raised fatherless and is now addicted to drugs and pornography and never went to church and hangs out in internet forums that mock God, that person with a spoon is more likely to mass murder than a person from a, an intact household who's a church attender and who has thought deeply and prayerfully about morality all his life is with an AR-15. Because pathologically bad people are dangerous regardless of regulations. Whether you're talking about guns, whether you're talking about trucks, whether you're talking about containers full of fertilizer and gasoline, whether you're talking about prison shanks that you carve out of spoons, you're right. Mm -hmm. We need to look upstream. It goes back to that sad worldview that we're talking about. We know that we can't fix this problem with government. And that ought to be the imperative. Right. The real application that we have to start talking about 
yes, of course, is you know rational deterrence and self-defense on one end, but again, healing a fractured and decrepit atrophied and immoral culture, man. Right. I mean, that's where the hardest work's going to be. Yeah, and you know what? This is the culture war, Nate. The culture war is not so much between two different cultures. I mean, that would be just kind of shallow tug of war between my tribe and your tribe. Like, I'm a Catholic. I want a Catholic tribe, and your stupid progressive tribe wants a different culture. No, it's actually a battle between culture and anti-culture, culturelessness. Ted Lieu can't even bow his head in silence for victims. He doesn't want a culture. He demands policy. He demands control in the hands of the state. That's all he can think of as a solution to a human tragedy. And that is an empty, hollow, horrible worldview that Orwell wrote about long enough ago that we should know better by now. And the 20th century also was a great depiction of when you replace culture with totalitarian impulses, which is all that's left on the left. Very sad. But okay, so another thing is, real quick point I want to get out. I recently got a book by my friend Jason Jones called The World is on Fire, and he made a great point about the Second Amendment. You can argue this way and you can argue that way about the efficacy of this and that and the other gun control law versus the expansion of gun ownership by the NRA, and those arguments are very heated. Jones goes a little deeper. He says that's just surface level. If you want to compare gun crime in the U.S. and how much we kill each other with gun crime in various countries in Europe and the rest of the world— Jason says, you may find that fewer citizens kill each other with guns in any given other part of the world, but let's go back further. When was the last time in the U.S. a tyranny arose and slaughtered half the population? (laughs) It never happens here because we have enshrined in our Constitution the Second Amendment. That's the purpose of the Second Amendment, is to resist tyrannies. The rest of the world, Europe... You gave rise to the most horrible, in Eastern Europe, the most horrible dictatorships that committed what he calls democide. It's a great argument. Millions have been, hundreds of millions have been killed in places where they enacted gun control. So don't you come to me about how, you know, citizens kill each other. The whole purpose of the Second Amendment isn't about citizens killing each other. It's preventing mass democide by government. You see? Oh, definitely. Oh, my gosh. We just a few days ago observed the 100th anniversary of the start of the Russian Revolution. And you look at the over 100 million people systematically deprived of their ability to defend themselves against the state. And then, of course, the state, totalitarian communist states did what totalitarian communist states do. They killed en masse in order to push their government-centered society society destroying agendas on all these people. Right. They could have used a second amendment. They could have. They could have. And you're right. At the end of the day, there are a million different utilitarian arguments that you can make, but there's really none that I've ever seen compelling from anyone in the gun control crowd that really addresses what Jones is getting at with that statement. Right. As long as governments are ruled by corrupt men who can do atrocious things, I would much rather have an insurance policy against that happening on any massive scale. Amen. That's right. Well, thank you, Nate, for joining us and giving this extremely insightful commentary. By the way, people, he's repeating commentary. You can also find in his videos at CRTV, and it's really solid stuff. Don't miss a single video from Nate. Well, thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. I love talking with you, brother. Same to you. Thanks for coming on. God bless. God bless you. Now I'm sitting down with Matt Rosendale. Matt Rosendale is the Montana State Auditor and also a candidate for U.S. Senate against John Tester. And also, Matt is a devout Catholic, and he, so he's very much of interest to us at Catholic Vote and to our listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Stephen. How you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. You must be doing well as well. You must be pumped. You're running against John Tester, who's a major cheerleader for Planned Parenthood. And as a Catholic, that must give you a real sense of purpose. It really does, you know, and it's, it's not just the fact of running against John and feeling like, okay, we're going to make a statement. We're going to make a change, not just a statement, because we are extremely well positioned to flip this seat, not just from a Democrat, but from a pro-choice, Chuck Schumer supporting Democrat. And we are really well positioned to make that change. There's been early information that has come out that shows us within basically the margin of error right now. Mm -hmm. And we haven't even begun running any type of advertising or anything. We we just feel very confident about this race. Yeah, well, I mean, his views, John Tester's views are very 
distasteful, I think, to Montanans. They are completely adverse to our principles and values, Stephen. Mm-hmm. problem is he gets away with trying to pull off this I'm a good old farmer, you know, act that he does. And then he goes back to Washington, D.C., and he votes with the hard left continuously. My gosh, we're seeing too much of that. And so thank you. And we're grateful to you for representing against that trend. So I have some questions for you, just real kind of rapid fire. First of all, as a Catholic, how do you celebrate Halloween? How does your family celebrate Halloween, given its roots as a, in the Catholic tradition is All Hallows' Eve? It's all Hallows' Eve, uh, we eat candy, and we, and we take care of the children as they come through. As a Catholic, yeah. I, I really focus my attention on All Saints Day, which follows you know right after. Mm-hmm. That's where we give honor to all the saints that have come before us. Very cool. All right. Now, do you have a favorite saint? What is one of your favorite saints, and why? You know, it's— um. My favorite saint, I would have to say, is Paul of Tarsus. Mm. You know, Paul went through that change, and and he was struck down Whoa. with— <laughs> That was the change, wasn't it? <laughs> ah, there's that bell ringing. <laughs> he, uh, he, was, he was struck down with blindness and was blessed with the grace of God to go out and see the error of his ways. And then you talk about a transformation. Now, here's someone who went from persecuting Christians mm. and thinking that he was doing the right thing— to going out and evangelizing the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That transformation, I think, and the work that he did thereafter should get everyone's attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, he was a tent maker, right? Yeah. What was your first job? How did you first make money as a child? Wow. The first job I had, I didn't make money. Uh (laughs) Seriously, my folks had a weekly newspaper when I was a, a child. So everyone, I have five siblings, participated in the uh, newspaper in some form or fashion. And I was taking photographs for Mm. the newspaper by the time I was probably about 12 years old. So that was my first working job. And then from there to earn money, I bus tables at the local restaurants. Nice. Do you, uh, just to be clear, this is a really important question to voters I know, and I'd like to ask it on their behalf. Do you, in fact, put your pants on one leg at a time? (laughs) <laughs> yes. I, what? The only the only folks I know that can get their pants on both legs at the same time are firemen. They can All jump right. in and, and get on the road really quick. All right. But what I'm really getting at is, what would you say your morning routine is on a typical day? My morning routine does start off the same way every day. And I, and I think it's critically important to start off with prayer. Mm. And I start off my prayer with asking for wisdom, to understand what God's plan is for me, Hmm. for strength and the resources to carry out that plan. And then I conclude with a request for a shield for myself and my family, because this work that we do now, it's tough. And there are a lot of people that are in opposition to this work, and they will attack not only me, but they will attack the rest of my family. So we need those prayers and, and the prayers from, from many of your listeners to uh, shield us from those attacks. Amen. You heard the man. we got to be praying for this guy and others like him who are pushing back against some real bigotry we're starting to see, very public and unapologetic, you know, anti-Catholicism and anti-Christianity, you know, the dogma lives loudly, debacle with Feinstein, and there's a lot of that going around. So one thing that I heard, by the way, I've got to get this and I've got to bring it up. You have a cattle ranch. Does that ever give you some reprieve? It does. I don't get back as often, nearly as often as I would like. Serving here in Helena for the state, that is six and a half hours away uh, Mm -hmm. drive from where the ranch is. I tell folks, I, I live closer to three other state capitals than my own, and one's up in Canada for Pete's sakes. But when I do mm. get back to the ranch, it, it is very, it's a, a healing experience, I can tell you. No more politics there. I, I was wondering, how many cattle do you have, and are they Republicans or Democrats or a mix? <laughs> they all taste the same to me. <laughs> 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 right now, my neighbors are leasing the property, and so they're thrilled, quite frankly, that I'm out of town. Not because they don't support me. Most support that I have Even though that this is a national race, the five most supportive counties in the nation that I have are here in Montana. So that's been quite a compliment and very supportive to me. 
That's great. Yeah, it speaks well of you. The people that know you best are supporting you the most. That's great. Yeah. Well, tell me about your campaign. What are your goals as a candidate for the U.S. Senate? You know, it's really easy, uh, Steve. I've served in the legislature here in Montana before I was elected as the Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, and I do serve the way that I campaign. You know, folks ask me to reduce spending, and I went to state government, and I did. And they asked me to reduce regulation, and I have. And they asked me to protect the sanctity of life at all stages, from the pre-born straight through to the most vulnerable in our society. And I do. And I protect the Second Amendment, and I protect our property rights. And these are the exact same things that I intend to do at the federal level. I think it's critically important that we return as much of the power that we possibly can back to the states, back to the people. Mm. That's what our founders intended. They never intended for the federal government to be as intrusive and as large as it is right now today. That's wonderful. You know, it's funny how cultural conservatism and limited government complement one another. And it's great to see that in our senators. Of course, another champion of that thought in general is uh, is Rand Paul and others in the Senate. There aren't enough of you. So it's neat to see the, you growing. We'll be definitely praying for you. And again, thank you for standing for what we believe in here at Catholic Vote. And I think what most of our listeners would like to see enacted more. No, I I really appreciate that. If you take all the work that we do or that I plan to do at the federal level, it basically boils down to three issues, and that is expansion of our economy, preservation of our culture, which is certainly our religious freedoms, and then protection of our country. And every vote that we take will basically be focused on one of those three issues. Excellent. You sound like you have a very clear-eyed and purposeful focus on these things, and I'm glad that you've narrowed it down that way. So we can now actually pay attention and hold you accountable (laughs) because you're so clear. It's great to hear such clear promises ahead of time. Well, I tell folks all the time, they don't have to worry about idle promises coming from Matt Rosendale. I have always served as I have campaigned. And when people look into my record, they become even more solid supporters because I do. I serve the same way that I campaign. So as they look into my votes and they look at my work, they know that. Heck, I was on... There's a YouTube clip when I did one of my first public announcements. It's in the Pro-Life March in Bozeman, Montana. Matt Rosendale, Pro-Life March in Bozeman, Montana. And I stood up and addressed the crowd there. And there were several hundred people. And I will tell you, Stephen, that I was the only public official that spoke that day. I'm an unapologetic pro-life conservative, I will tell you. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us. It's really an honor to have you. And listeners, make sure you keep your eye out for Matt Rosendale, Montana State Auditor and candidate for the U.S. Senate. And we will be praying for you, Matt. Thank you so much. And God bless you and all your listeners. Amen. Same to you. Now we come to the part of the show where we have our weekly political discussion with Catholic Vote Political Director Josh Mercer. How are you doing, Josh? Hey, great day. Great to be with you. Well, a couple of nights ago, big election uh, night in Virginia, and some surprises, some things not so surprising, but uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. First of all, what do you think of the Democrat reaction? (laughs) Because they had a huge night. I mean, it was big successes. Do you think they have a right to be enthused? Are they overly enthused? What do you think? Well, I mean... It was a big night for Democrats in Virginia, and what it points to is that Democrats right now have a great ground game. They are very enthusiastic. I would even call it white, hot enthusiasm. They are energized to vote. They want to come out to the ballot box. They'll vote for any Democrat as a means of saying no to President Trump. So if you look at special elections, there's been four House elections to replace Republicans across the country from Kansas to Georgia. And in each of those cases, the Republicans won. And Republicans are like, see, look, we're winning. We're doing fine. But the problem was, in each of those cases, the Republican was supposed to win. And they were supposed to win by big margins. And the Democrats came out in force 
and they almost won in some of those spots. Right. So the point was, the lessons that we should have learned from the last four special elections isn't that, oh, Republicans have no problems, Democrats are, are never going to win. No, in fact, it was Democrats are extremely enthusiastic about voting. They can't wait to get to the ballot box and cast a ballot for a Democrat against Trump in those four special elections. There just wasn't enough Democrats because those districts were very Republican. But there in Virginia, which is a state that had been trending Democrat for so long. Right. In fact, there's only been one Republican governor in the 21st century. The Democrats have won race after race from governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, statewide. And obviously, Obama won twice and Hillary Clinton just you know won Virginia in 2016. So it has gone from being a Republican state from 1964 to 2000 to becoming a purple state for a while. Now, Virginia looks like it is definitely a blue state. It is a Democratic state. Yeah. Kind of shows, though, and this is kind of bad news for Republicans, that the you know we've been making fun of leftist tears and, and how upset they've been over the Trump election, but apparently their, their butt hurt translates into the ballot box, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, their tears are turning into ballots, and that should concern you know Republicans. Now, Democrats think this is you know just the beginning of everything, and, and that a year from now they are going to romp Republicans from coast to coast, you know, and that that might happen. There might be a Democratic wave in twenty eighteen. Right. We don't know yet. Right. Well, this left lash in in Virginia, though, that brings us to what the lesson might be for Republicans in general, because uh, there there are kind of two reactions on the Republican end. On the one hand, you have a lot of people saying, oh, darn it, you know, Trump is ruining everything. Um, he's upset them. Uh, he's upset the left and and he's kind of an embarrassment. And, uh, oh, if only if we had a better and more statesman statesman like president, things would work better for the GOP. And then on the other hand, you have folks like like Bannon and Trump himself who kind of said Gillespie lost because he wasn't Trumpy enough, <laughs> you know. So, I mean. Those are very opposite reactions, and there's this sort of civil war going on in the GOP to some degree. What can those two camps learn? Yeah, I mean, ironically enough, they're both half right and half wrong. I mean, hmm. you know, Steve Bannon came out and said, look, you know, I offered a campaign for Gillespie, and he turned me down. And President Trump said, you know, he never really campaigned for me. All he'd let me do is send out a few tweets. If, if you would have just embraced me, you know, and Trumpism more, he would have won. Uh -huh. I don't think that's true, actually. I think it is Gillespie did actually embrace some of Trump's agenda, which is sort of the cultural thing, immigration, national security end of it. But he never Gillespie never embraced the economic nationalism or putting the workers first, understanding, you know, let's right. be concerned about blue collar jobs and people who are paycheck to paycheck who are getting slammed by Obamacare and an economy that has been so slow to get moving. But on the other hand, Gillespie did about as good as Trump did in Virginia. And that's the whole point is Trump lost Virginia as well. And Trump wasn't going to win Virginia. And I don't foresee any possibility that Trump wins Virginia in 2020 unless Trump wins 40 states because Virginia is a Democratic state now. Right. So the lesson from this is the Republicans in Congress had better get their act moving, get something passed. Exactly. Whether it's health care reform or tax reform. If the Republicans in Congress are going to continue to twiddle their thumbs for the next year, then yes. You will lose not just in Virginia, you will lose coast to coast. You got to get your act together. Right. You can't just say, well, we're not Hillary. Hillary's not going to be running in 2018. Right. You need to get something done. You need to deliver for the working uh, men and women in this country. And, and you know what? Establishment and Trumpian Republicans together. Exactly. You know, it seems like to me that. right now, the Democrats have lost so abysmally that Democrats are now really focused on the ground game and on, on 2018. I'm afraid that the GOP is still thinking about 2020 and still high on 2016. Well, they're not paying enough attention to 2018 is the point, right? Exactly. I'm sorry, but you just cannot rest on your coattails. You need to get something done. And you know what? Honestly, it needs presidential leadership as well. Right. Donald Trump, if he wants them to succeed and to win in 2018, he needs to say, we need an agenda to get passed that will help the working class moms and dads and families out there. The worst thing that we could do for the Republicans would be if they cut corporate taxes and then middle class families don't get much of a tax cut. You know, they're the ones that are going to go out and vote. Right. And, and look, Trump won them. That was the big story of 2016. In 2016, the, that reason was you need to prevent Hillary Clinton from becoming president because she would be devastating. Right. But, you know, you don't have her as a boogeyman out there to conjure up the votes in 2018. You need to give voters a reason to vote for you in 2018.
Amen. That's a good lesson, and a good lesson in every direction. Everyone can learn something from this. Thanks for your great analysis, Josh. And how can we stay in the loop on 2018 matters and policy matters in the next coming months? Go to catholicvote.org and sign up for our daily email newsletter, The Loop. It's quick and easy. Read every day, three to five minutes, and it helps you keep up to speed on all these issues. All right. I can't wait to talk to you next week, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I'm not going to get home. And now I am sitting down with a great hero of the pro-life movement, Marjorie Dannenfelser. She is the president of the Susan B. Anthony List. She's everywhere in the media, and she is the (laughs) anti-Cecile Richards. Thank you so much for joining us, Marjorie. Oh, thank you, Stephen, my favorite Twitter friend. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you're you're awesome. That's it. (laughs) That's the end of the interview. I've gotten, I want to quit while I'm in it, Marjorie. That's a wrap. (laughs) Thank you. But I I do think of you as the anti-Cecile Richards. I don't know if you've ever met Cecile Marjorie, but man, would she not like to meet you, I bet. (laughs) Well, you know, one thing is interesting is like, I used to believe what Cecile believes, but it is true that my change put me on the opposite end of the spectrum from where she's dug in her heels. She truly believes what she espouses to be true. I used to echo that. But look, Mm -hmm. if you change your mind on something that fundamental, you will run as fast as you can to be the anti-Cecile Richards. So thank you for that accolade. I don't know if I deserve it, but I appreciate it. Well, I think you I think you do. But you're right. You didn't start out this way. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, in college, you were not only pro-choice, but weren't you the head of a pro-choice organization as an undergraduate? Well, oddly, and this will show you how times have changed, we had two chairs of college Republicans. But the way it was institutionalized there is that one chair had to be pro-choice and the other had to be pro-life. So I was that designee. And I really did believe it. I was said all the things that you hear now and you say, well, that just is so shallow. My body, my choice. Mm-hmm. Who are you? To, who are you to tell me what to do with my body? I became a philosophy major and it was just really hard to even get those words out of your mouth then. You know, they just sound so illogical. Yeah. When you converted, so to speak, to the pro-life position, you kind of simultaneously converted to Catholicism, didn't you? Yeah. And really only the good Lord knows like which track was going when. But I grew up in eastern North Carolina where it's like another world religion, like Muslim, Judaism, Catholicism, and then there's Christianity. (laughs) And um, really not really smart in my thought about it then. But the people that I met, they were the people that just opened the door of my heart to actually consider anything else. Because we try to teach our children this and we try to be this way that the truth matters more than anything. No matter your reputation, what you've staked out in your life to be, do, get. And if the truth really matters, you start listening to people who are speaking the truth. And that leads you into areas that you never thought you'd go. I swear I'm the I'll never blank person that lived to see me do all of those things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you know, like uh, never live in the North. I would never you know, marry a guy from New Jersey. For some reason, New Jersey was like the ultimate. You just wouldn't do that. Of course, that's exactly <laughs> what I did. Catholicism wasn't a thought. But when I came in contact with it with the beginning, I said never. And I knew a few people that were pro-life. Yeah. But when I decided what I was about, I said, I, I will never take that position. Right. It makes no sense for a woman to take that position. So all those things I said never to. So, <laughs> you know, be afraid of that word. <laughs> what you said is very true, though. Immense strides have been made. And I think that you and the Susan B. Anthony list have been at the center of a lot of those strides. The 2016 election was significant. We had a big Republican field of potential presidents, and they had to prove that they were pro-life to even be considered. You cannot win on the right if you're not really seriously, devotedly pro-life. An immense change, isn't it, from the 70s and 80s? Yeah. Even up until about 2012, the issue was in jeopardy of being completely buried Mm -hmm. and ineffective without muscle. So in 2012, I think you have to look at that election. Everything that happened in that election, Romney was our nominee, Obama was the other. There were several disastrous Senate elections. The Republican Party blamed the pro-life issues being the issue that killed the election. I think they actually exacerbated the problem when our when our candidates made mistakes, and it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. But whatever happened, at the end, when we had lost the presidency and lost all these Senate seats, everyone was pointing at the pro-life movement. Right. And at that point, you either just pack it up and say, oh, well, babies, I guess you're just somebody else is going to help you. Or you really dig in and say, all right, how did the left do this? Right. And I really think that that was the moment where we said, Everything that we're doing here at Susan B. Anthony List has to be directed 
towards leveraging all of that organic power that we have on the ground into winning elections so that we can pass laws with our newly elected officials that will save the lives of unborn children. And when you do that, you prove that not only is it the right thing to do to primary candidates, yeah. et it's not only the right, right thing to do, but it is the politically smart thing to do. That's big. And yeah, it's huge. And I think that is the biggest difference. Now, there is one candidate in Pennsylvania. His name is Charlie Dent. We decided this is the election. And I mean this one, like this cycle that we're in. Mm -hmm. This is finally time to defeat Charlie Dent in a primary because he is a perfect pro-abortion record in the House of Representatives. So right. as soon as we got revved up, we're recruiting a great candidate. He gets out of the race. He knows that his time is up. Not only is his time up, but so is the time up for every Republican pretty much running for office in the whole country. And I think what's seeping over, Stephen, we can and shouldn't just be one, a one-party group. It's seeping over into the Democratic Party as well. Yeah, it's becoming unacceptable to give no sympathetic nod, at least, yes. to the pro-life sentiment. Now, you and I have talked before, Marjorie, about the fact that not enough people are aware of, but I think you're really, really tuned into it. It's a minority of far-left activists who are really, really, really insistently pro-abortion at least I'm talking about among voters, right? Yes. If you get the pro-life message to the average person, they're more likely to find it appealing than the message of, say, Planned Parenthood and Cecile Richards of shout your abortion. That's repulsive to most people, That's right. isn't it? That's right. And that is, I mean, back to your central point, which I think is the main point, which is how things started to change. When we're talking to those people who are not wearing T-shirts that say, I love the fact that I had an abortion, that's like almost no one. But when you're talking to the rest of America mm -hmm. in battleground states during the presidential election, in battleground states, in Senate elections, and you're going door to door, which we do, and talking to voters about what's actually happening and what your incumbent senator is doing to represent or not represent you, he is voting for late term abortion. You find out two things. They didn't even know that late term abortion was legal. Right. And they cannot believe that their incumbent senator could possibly be for something like that. And that is how the 2014 elections issued a great new fantastic crop of U.S. senators from all over that made this Senate the most pro-life Senate that we've had, I believe, ever. Wow. It's that direct correlation between those conversations with voters at their front doors, a million conversations like that end up staffing a Senate, putting a president in the White House who is committed to certain pro-life actions being taken, mm -hmm. and why we're on the why we're on the offense in the pro-life movement right now. We're on the offense. That's a good way of putting it. You know, it's not just yeah. that, oh, my goodness, Trump is so pro-life and no one else was. There's also been a cultural <laughs> shift. When I was following the 2016 election, I was stunned at how pro-life President Trump became. In fact, I wrote an article during the campaigns kind of an article written to never Trumpers. And I said, even if you don't like Trump, you don't want to vote for Trump, vote for Marjorie Dannenfelser. <laughs> and <laughs> in other words, vote for the people he has chosen to take into his inner circle, which really signals that he's not just pro-life, he's Marjorie Dannenfelser pro-life, right? This is like really serious pro-life. He even wrote a written note to us at Catholic Vote and signed it, making specific pro-life promises. Yes. And I think it wasn't just because Trump is so pro-life. There was a major cultural shift that made it necessary for any GOP presidential candidate to be that adamant. Amen. And I think that's greatly thanks to your activism. So how did that happen? Well, by the grace of God, and not just me, a, a whole army of people, I was not for Trump. I wasn't a never Trump. I was a we better make sure that all these primary candidates are making commitments that once they're running, that they're going to stick. Right. The one who made the most concrete, like when I say concrete, I mean written out and with adjectives to describe Hillary Clinton's position and all of that was Donald Trump. Now, I agree with you. I'm not God. I can't see into his heart. I can't put him on a scale of comparison with everybody else. I don't think any of us right. thought that he was as pro-life is Carly Free Arena, for instance, who I loved. Right. But what he did know is that he had a deal to make. And, you know, we can overstate the art of the deal. However, this is how he thinks. He knew that it was the right position to take. I believe he really believes it. He put people around him who reflect that, including the vice president. Right. He put into writing what his commitments would be when he was in the Oval Office. And he has not backtracked on any of those commitments. Hmm. Not one day. And I think that is what is really a new day. You get politics on track so much for the pro-life movement that they know, even if they wanted to, which he doesn't, but say they say somebody wanted to, they're not going to turn back. That is not inevitable that it will always be that way. 
this is a matter of, I think we've reached a really important point in terms of our power and leverageability of the movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just need to be so vigilant, not just to maintain, but to increase that power. And I really believe that with, thank God that young people now are so not like I was when I was young, (laughs) because I think this is the generation that is really going to see the saving of so many little boys and girls, that new civil rights movement is exploding and how that's going to feel. A job well done. Well, you know, to oppose that new civil rights movement, as you call it, is more and more difficult. And I think part of the reason why it's so difficult to oppose the pro-life position now is you kind of have to tell untruths to tamp down the revolution. (laughs) So, for example, you have to say that David Daleiden's videos are fabricated when they're not. Anyone can just Google them and watch them in in, in their entirety. You have to, for instance, a great big story was just tweeted out. A little girl born at 22 weeks is now thriving. She's going to survive and she's going to be fine. At 22 weeks and even for four more weeks after, it would be legal to kill her through the most brutal means, basically to torture torture her to death in a Planned Parenthood yes. clinic. Yes. You have to show that picture and say that American doesn't have civil rights. And you have to try to make the argument that denying that American civil rights mm-hmm. is the good guy's position. And that requires telling untruths, right? It does. And I really think I do a whole lot of interviews in the mainstream media. I don't talk to the Huffington Post. It just doesn't work out. <laughs> but honest people will have a conversation with you. And when you get to the point of saying, well, look, if we're talking about a woman's body and an appendectomy or a tonsillectomy, then you should be furious with me because I am so out of line to tell you whether you should get one of those procedures or not. But say there are two people, then I'm making a very reasonable argument until you can come to terms with whether it's two people or just one, then you really aren't having an honest argument anymore. Mm. And I think that is where they lose every time because as you say, there is nothing that sounds like the truth when you're arguing, this is anything but a human being. It doesn't sound like the truth at all. Anybody that's ever been born at an early stage can't think of it as anything other than a than a human. Mm-hmm. You know, I think Carla Fiorina was one of the best at articulating this. Like, you know, we all we we're all a zygote. Call it what you want. It was you. It was me. Right. It was us. <laughs> right. You know. So yeah, you just it's getting harder and harder for left. I think it's why Nancy Pelosi, Lujan, who's the head of the Democratic Campaign Committee, yeah. um, why they are saying that this can't be a litmus test for Democrats in much of America anymore, and that is revolutionary. To right. hear those people saying those words means not that I necessarily think they don't think their hearts have changed at all, but it means they're looking at a political reality that we need to hype up and make sure it continues to really reach the heart of, of Democrats as well. Right. And I just have to add, Stephen, that in the successful elections that we've seen 2014 and 2016, that Democrats who were not necessarily attracted by the Republican economic message were very attracted by the no late term abortion message. It is an issue that cuts across all the ethnic and partisan lines and really goes straight to the grassroots, real people who just can't believe anything like that could be happening in this country. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that's, and you know, it's funny, uh, you remember the Women's March? During the first few weeks of the Trump administration, one of the major casualties during that sort of panicking leftist frenzy in response to the election of Donald Trump was women. I don't consider myself a feminist, but the Susan B. Anthony list, right? Susan B. Anthony was a devoted feminist. Yes, indeed. That's a big part of this. And uh, she was also pro-life. But the other factor in a lot of debate about abortion is, in my view, misogyny, Mm -hmm. primarily on the pro-abortion side. Mm -hmm. It's really quite stark, isn't it? It's pretty amazing. It's really a a sight to behold. And I know you're not necessarily referring to this, but I would say the early feminists, the women who got us into politics in the first place, which I can be so thankful for, really believed that abortion was a tool of exploitation of women. Harvey Weinstein would agree. Exactly. exactly. I mean, he's he's a major donor to Planned Parenthood and, and of course, a womanizer. And many, many infamous womanizers are uh, big supporters of abortion for obvious reasons, right? Erase the evidence of your having used a woman. that's right. No, that's, that's it. You know, Alice Paul, who was the author of the original Equal Rights Amendment called abortion the ultimate exploitation of women for that very reason. It was no small thing. That was why they're also, um, for us Catholics, it's kind of a bummer, but Susan B. Anthony, a lot of those 
early feminists were also in the temperance movement. And the reasons they were involved, mm-hmm. they were the best reasons. <laughs> they were, <laughs> they were um, fighting the exploitation of women by men who are getting drunk and impregnating them and then doing away with the evidence by making, sending them to the other side of town to get an abortion. Wow. When we have these arguments now with Cecile Richards or whoever about the early feminists, they're like, oh, where's your evidence? The evidence is massive. We have quotes all over the place, writings. We've got all that stuff. But where they always go is it just wasn't healthy to have. They didn't have safe legal abortion back then. So of course they were not necessarily the greatest advocates of it. Well, Susan B. Anthony said, this act will burden her conscience in life. It will burden her soul in the grave. But thrice guilty is the one who drove her to the dreadful deed. That is not someone who's saying, we need to make abortion safe, legal, and rare. (laughs) This is a woman who's saying that it impacts her soul and shame on the one who drove her to that abortion. And now we can say, who was driving every woman to get an abortion? We can say that Planned Parenthood is the number one driver and shame on them for driving these women to the dreadful deed that compounds every problem that they have in their life and puts a layer of cloud cover that makes it almost impossible sometimes to come back out again. Amen. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they're they're in evidence of it is that there's an enormous industry of ministries and psychological firms that help women who are damaged by abortion. Yes. These women go to these firms and say, I need help. I had an abortion. Why are they doing that? Yeah. Because they feel proud? (laughs) No, they're damaged. They're hurting. Yeah. There's Uh, such a gap. There's such a gap between that T-shirt that says, I don't regret my abortion, and the utter misery and sadness that is in quiet, that is not at a rally or a march. It's grieving in private and living through the feeling that no one can help you because no one will acknowledge with you that there's anything to feel pain about. My wife suffered a miscarriage mm-hmm. and it left her depressed yeah. almost cripplingly for quite some time. Yes, yes. I mean, and, and that, that's, that's actually a physiological fact. I yeah. mean, that just happens. Yes. But this is what Cecile Richards would say, that actually the major issues that drive women to abortion Women are driven to abortion by not being paid a minimum wage <laughs> or by not mm-hmm. having, you know, by, by life being hard in general in ways that can only be fixed with left wing socioeconomic policy. Yeah. How do you answer that? I mean, one thing I will say at the outset is interesting. Funny how you never say that about guns. Yeah, that's yeah, that's <laughs> when, when there are gun deaths, you never say, well, let's address the cultural. Don't ban them. Let's just talk about the underlying cultural issues, which are, by the way, the breakdown of the family, other right. things that are actually um, talked about mostly by the Christian right. But how do you answer that question? Of, well, uh, I think it's, uh, a, yeah. it's a very good point. It says a lot about how do you problem solve? If you're a person of hope, a person who believes in the dynamism of the human spirit, what it looks like to fail forward, you will really address a problem in a very different way than Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger, who started it. Margaret Sanger's perspective was clear out the underbrush. All these people, all these problems, you know, they're just infecting and crowding the rest of us. Just get them out of here. They got too many problems and they'll just create more problems. And so the other perspective is each one of those people has such power, purpose, a thing to do in life that not one other person can do. They'll never be created again. So it can never be a solution to a problem to kill the one that seems to be causing the problem. Right. That is what life is. And it's not to set aside in any small way what those problems are. But what we cannot do is eliminate the, quote, creators of the problem. What we do when we are compassionate people and we have respect for others is we support them in the solutions to the problems that that are occurring in their lives. We reach out to them in times of crisis. We say, there's more room for everyone. This is a big pie society, not a shrinking pie society. I just see death, hopelessness, and destruction in that other worldview. And I see life, hope, and power and sense of purpose in the pro-life view. And that is attractive. Amen. So do you think that because of that dynamic, because of that contrast, one is bound to fail? I mean, in other words, <laughs> you think that, that death and destruction and sorrow and so mm-hmm. forth are, less, are, are a harder sell in the long run? Well, of course, the only way evil flourishes is that good people fail to step up. That Edmund Burke quote, I never get quite right, but that's basically it. Of course, evil could flourish and it could prevail. I don't think that's where we're headed right now. I think we're headed 
in the way of hope and light and the Holy Spirit, but it is not predetermined. We also don't think that. We're also incredibly powerful at undoing good things. Right. But I think we are winning. And I really believe that we have the momentum. And I think it's beautiful to see successes because they inspire us for more. And I'm not just talking about the laws that we need in place that are the result of a civil rights movement, but also that human on human interaction to meet pain and address it where it exists and also meet arguments where they exist on the community level. And I have such a sense of hope. I didn't 10 years ago, but I have such a sense of hope that we are headed in the right direction and that there are young people stepping up right now that are picking up the baton and are making this a culture of life that has always been a dream, but not as much a reality as it should be. Awesome. So by the way, just for our listeners who may be listening and getting too happy, your brand of hope is not a lazy one. Your brand of hope isn't just reflective and philosophical. Your brand of hope pushes one to action, doesn't it? And what are some of the actions that you recommend? I mean, because there's activism, there's politicking, there's cultural change. It's a lot. Yeah. What what, what, what do you think are some of the some of the things that we can do. There's a lot of them. And I think if you don't exhaust yourself, you might be sorry that you didn't when it comes to this because it's saving lives. So I think the biggest heroes in the pro-life movement right now are actually going door to door right now in states across the country, in Florida, Ohio, Missouri, Indiana, soon to be Wisconsin and Montana Mm. and North Dakota. Those are all places where our door to door friends are talking to citizens all over those states about what's at stake in the next Senate election. There's that, and that's hard work. There's also constantly being vigilant and calling your senators and congressmen and making sure they know your view Mm -hmm. on whatever vote is coming up. So staying up on what is coming up is vital. And communicating effectively to your senator and congressman, the state legislator, is the whole ball of wax in terms of creating laws that will save lives. Right. And, you know, if you could, I wasn't here to hawk our website, but you do have yeah, a way. Tell of, us, tell us, how, how, does a, how does a person in any number of the states that's going to be a battleground in the Senate, especially, how where do they go if they want to volunteer to do some door to door work? I would just go to our website and just send a message through our website to say, I live in one of those states. I'm willing to help out. I'm willing to live in that state and, and help out. Right. These are paid positions, by the way. So um, the good news is we have a lot of people who are doing this full time in Mm -hmm. a lot of these states. So just go on our website and send us a message and say, I'm interested in doing something like that. If that's not something you can do, but you are willing to reach out to your legislators, there's a way of doing that also through our website. And it's just, if you just Google Susan B. Anthony list, you'll see the website right away. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much, Marjorie. And we'll be keeping up to date. By the way, folks, you should follow Marjorie and the Susan B. Anthony list on Twitter. You can just search for them. I retweet them pretty frequently, but they're also pretty entertaining and uplifting (laughs) to follow. (laughs) Hey, it takes one to know one, Stephen. I follow you and and watch you all the time. So watch out. Oh, thank you. (laughs) I'll be careful. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. Bless you. Bless you too. Well, that's it for this week. You've been listening to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour, produced in the image and likeness of the eternal podcast in the sky. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. See you next week.